Okay, thank you, Jean, for that uh, kind introduction. So what I'll do over the course of the next uh, 50, 55 minutes is to uh, give you some information on uh, three discrete uh, subjects, uh, moving from the specific to the general. Uh, one is the, the recent advances in our treatment of uh, aplastic anemia, not a disease that I know, I know that you will likely see uh, a patient or have to uh, make treatment decisions, but a remarkable example of uh, success in hematology and in medicine and looking at the, the number of gray heads uh, in, the, uh, in the audience, I'm, or bald heads in the audience, I'm uh, going to be able to uh, tell you that a disease that most of you saw as being uniformly and rapidly fatal in training is now one that is manageable in almost uh, all patients. Uh, the second uh, is to tell you about uh, the new telomeropathies. That's a much a more general and uh, uh, internal medicine interest. Uh, there are patients that you undoubtedly have seen in your own clinics who have telomeropathies. They're not rare and uh, they're hard to recognize because they involve multi-organs and be, can be quite subtle. Uh, so you either will retrospectively or prospectively be able to make this uh, diagnosis. The third point is uh, also of general interest, which is the relationship between telomere attrition, which is a normal phenomena, but also can be accelerated genetically or iatrogenically, and cancer. Um, so uh, I'm starting with aplastic anemia. It's a fantastic disease, first described at the end of the 19th century by this man, Paul Ehrlich, in his younger days when he was a docent at uh, Charité Hospital in Berlin. Did an autopsy on a young woman who had died after a catastrophic brief illness, bleeding, clearly anemic, probably infected. And when he broke open her bone, uh, he saw, well, not this. He didn't have a confocal microscope, but he saw, instead of the, pl the, the plump, juicy marrow of megaloblastic anemia, because pernicious anemia at the end of the 19th century was common in Germany and fatal, instead of seeing the rich bone marrow of B12 deficiency, he saw fat. Uh, and that was the basis of his case report, probably not publishable in the New England Journal these days. So this is a confocal image. I don't think I'm going to be able to get it to, to move for um, some reason, for a variety of reasons, but this picture shows you the marrow under the most modern uh, techniques. Uh, this is a marrow that is devoid of normal hematopoiesis. You'll see that more clearly in a mouse model image in a moment. It's filled with fat. That's what's shown in green. And CD34, which is stained with red here and which is uh, the compartment of hematopoietic progenitor and stem cells. Uh, is only staining uh, the endothelium. That's the vasculature that you're seeing in uh, red. This is uh, a patient with aplastic anemia. I'm going to return to her in the middle of my talk. Uh, she's somewhat older than typical, uh, but she's got uh, most of the clinical manifestations. Uh, she's presenting with anemia. She's pale. She's bleeding in multiple sites. So this is very alarming to the patient, obviously, and to the emergency room physician or primary health care provider. Has petechiae ecchymosis, and shortly afterwards became infected. So it can be a very dramatic presentation. Bone marrow is really an important organ. If it's not functioning, if the blood counts are really low, as in severe disease, it's really uniformly fatal. The, these survival curves are from the 60s and 70s when, uh, for example, Jean and I were in training. And patients with severe disease defined by blood counts would be dead a year or a year and a half after um, presentation, even with modern blood transfusions. This is a disease of young people, which makes it even more troubling uh, to deal with. Usually young people who have been previously quite well. You see that the peak is in the late teenage years and early 20s and 30s. It's a disease also that has interesting environmental connections. Uh, shown on the left is a clipping from a 1930s newspaper, a 1920s newspaper in New York, uh, which made the association between benzene exposure and the leather factories of northern New Jersey and uh, bone marrow failure. It actually did not lead to any changes in benzene use. Uh, uh, despite the great campaigning on the part of the Essex County coroner. That's not a problem in the United States anymore. It is a problem in countries like China where there are actually epidemics of benzene poisoning uh, that uh, arise in uh, industrial uh, sectors. Um, on the right, though, is uh, the more common phenomenon, which is idiosyncratic bone marrow failure uh, uh, due to medical drug use. This also is a, a, t a terrible occasion for the patient uh, who may be only taking a thyrostatic or an antibiotic and for the treating physician and obviously the consulting hematologist. It also has a major impact on drug development. And this clipping from the New York Times shows not only the stock share price, but paralleling that would be the number of people doing research in this company with only two dozen cases of uh, bone marrow failure, aplastic anemia resulting from the introduction of a new drug into the market. Uh, this is a ward in, uh, north, uh, in the northern part of Vietnam in Hanoi, a picture I took some uh, years ago. Aplastic anemia is a very common disease. 
uh, in hematology services in East Asia, in China, uh, Southeast Asia, and India. Uh, this is the female service. At that time, there were two or three patients stacked to a bed, and you know, third to a third to a half of the patients in a hematology service have bone marrow failure, whereas most of you will not see a patient in a year, and even a hematologist may only see one per year. We've done formal epidemiologic studies in Southeast Asia, and the rate of the disease, the incidence of the disease, is two or three times higher than it is in very similarly performed studies done in Europe and Israel, and probably also uh, in the United States. This is a slide I took just recently on a trip to India and shows the same thing. Uh, and you can just note, uh, as the uh, physician giving this uh, talk, he's shown in the upper left, uh, noted that in, in this large uh, hematology service, aplastinemia is actually a more common diagnosis than is acute myeloid leukemia in the Bengali uh, area of um, India. Now, in the historic period uh, that uh, Jean was alluding to in uh, my CV, uh, we thought of aplastinemia really in isolation. It was one of these oddities uh, separated from other hematologic diseases, other medical diseases. The focus was entirely on the etiology that came from history and uh, supposition. And it was endless, uh, I think in retrospect rather foolish, uh, questioning of the patient for possible exposures, none of which were relevant to what happened to the patient afterwards. He was usually sent home uh, to die with minimal uh, transfusions. Now we have a modern, not final, but a modern view of aplastic anemia that looks something like this. It's a very simple outline, which is that there are two major components. I'm going to tell you about a third, which is the genetics. But the major components are the hematopoietic system, which is gone, uh, but not completely in patients with aplasia, and the immune system, which is doing the killing of those hematic progenitor and stem cells. So in the first phase, we do have some inciting event, but we don't worry about that. We think that in almost all cases, it disturbs the immune system. There are some ideas of how it might do that. Leads to almost total destruction of the hematopoietic compartment because the bone marrow, like a lot of other organs, is capable of pretty good function until almost all the cells are gone. Then there's recovery, which can occur, I think, rather uninterestingly as a result of transplant, more provocatively when we give immunosuppressive drugs from a biological point of view. And then what I want to stress at the end of my talk is this late phenomena of the development of leukemia or myelodysplastic syndrome in a subset of patients, about 15 percent, who have responded uh, in some cases to uh, anti-immune uh, system therapy. So this is a, an updated view of the Venn diagram in which you now can relate aplastic anemia on the one side to other immune-mediated diseases that affect a single organ or almost invariably T-cell uh, mediated and also to leukemia and um, uh, myelodysplasia. This is adding the genetics, and I'm going to talk a bit about that, especially as far as the inherited mutations are concerned in hematopoietic uh, stem cells um, <coughs> as we go along. So this is a, this is a dramatic case that uh, we treated back in uh, the 1980s, so we have a long follow-up, a young man with uh, hepatitis, seronegative, non-A, non-B, non-C, two or three months later, very stereotypically, develops a very severe pancytopenia invariably fatal in uh, these patients, uh, according to the literature. Comes to the NIH uh, from Colorado, is treated with just four days of uh, rather mild immunosuppressive called antithymocyte globulin and six months of cyclosporin. You see the dramatic rise in the blood counts, which were sustained and have been sustained as he now has entered his uh, 30s. This is a summary of many trials of antithymocyte globulin, a polyclonal preparation made from uh, horse serum of uh, antibodies directed against thymus cells. You see that the NIH actually has the largest or among the largest uh, studies as a single center institution. I also think the most careful studies, since we're able to have long follow-up to do bone marrow, cytogenetics, morphology, histochemistry without fiscal constraint. We have, at least up until recently, the most uh, detailed uh, information on our patients as they enter and go through therapy. And you see very consistent results between 60 and 70 percent of patients who have a single round of this immunosuppressive therapy recover marrow function and blood. Uh, so we're losing uh, these nice images. I don't know if I can go back and show you. This is a mouse model, uh, which uh, you're not going to be able to see completely. But I'll just tell you, uh, using uh, words, that uh, when we take very small numbers of lymphocytes that are mismatched either for the major or minor histocompatibility loci and infuse those into a mouse that's mismatched, we produce very uh, specific bone marrow failure and can demonstrate the potency of small numbers of lymphocytes. They're far more effective than any chemotherapy that we can give in specifically destroying the bone marrow. And that's destruction as a result, again, through using mouse models of 
CD8 cells as the effectors, type 1 uh, cytokines, and a major bystander effect. In other words, once the destructive process begins, it affects all the cells that are present, even if only a few are targeted at the outset, including cells at that point that are matched, either for H2 or minor histocompatibility. Now, I want to just tell you briefly about uh, two major trials that were done across the street, both of which have been very informative of treatment and also give you an update on where we, where we are. Now, the first is rather banal. We did a, a, a complicated study that was intended actually to test a drug that's not shown here, which turned out to be a bust. Uh, I had, these two studies actually have told me that I don't really know how to do clinical research because I keep getting results exactly the opposite of the ones we hypothesized. Rapid antithymocyclobin is more potent than horse. When it came on the market in the United States, it was likely, based on results, for example, in renal uh, allograft uh, rejection, transplantation in general, that rabbit would be better than horse because it was more effective. And we did a study that incorporated a comparison of these two similarly named and similarly labeled antithymocyclobulins. Um, and the reason it ended up in the New England Journal, as opposed to some obscure hematology subspecialty venue, is that the results were the opposite of those predicted, which is that we saw the usual 60 to 70 percent response rate. In this case, I think it was 68 percent at six months for the horse ATG. That's a very good response rate, meaning patients are transfusion independent, good neutrophil numbers, and um, uh, about half of that with the rabbit uh, ATG. The New England Journal insisted on some sort of mechanism. What I think they really meant is that they wanted to see some biological difference between these two ATGs. They sound the same. And the most likely difference, uh, even though the rabbit ATG is far more potent, as we expected, you see that in pink is the very dramatic reduction in total lymphocyte count with rabbit ATG compared to the more transient reduction with horse, is that unfortunately that reduction is directed at CD4 cells and especially at T regulatory cells. So T regulatory cells are simply gone in patients who get rabbit ATG for six months, whereas they recover quickly to actually better than uh, previous uh, um, numbers in patients who receive horse. Now, is that absolutely, no, we don't know that, but that's the strongest association that we were able to observe with all lymphocyte subsets, multiple cytokines, and microarrays. Now, the, the long-term effects of uh, this effective antithymocyclobulin therapy are obvious, and these are the results of uh, long-term survival curves. You see they go out for a decade or longer, and patients who actually respond to that first round of immunosuppression have virtually 90, almost 100 percent long-term survival, and that's been consistent for multiple decades. We've also improved the treatment of patients who fail that first round of horse ATG, and uh, we now have results in terms of survival with, um, in these failed patients that are not dissimilar from what we saw at the very outset when we were treating patients in toto at NIH back in the 1980s. So most of them will be alive uh, five to ten years later, and the reasons for that are varied. They're, I think, mostly the credit of the pharmaceutical industry, which has developed much more effective and easily administered antifungal drugs. Our aggressiveness in giving second uh, courses of immunosuppression, which I'm not going to go into detail, and also the ability to go to uh, alternative donor transplantation in patients who have failed. Uh, so multiple reasons. So this is the sort of story overall, this great improvement in overall response rates. Now, what does the failure do to? I actually don't think it's due to a non-immune pathophysiology with perhaps rare instances. And again, for the generalists in the audience, we know that we have patients with multiple sclerosis who can present with a single episode of optic neuropathy or some other uh, 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 neurologic syndrome. We call it multiple sclerosis, and they're fine. We have other patients who have progressive disease that kills them in a, a, just a few years. We have patients with ulcerative colitis whose only symptoms may be a bloody diarrhea every couple of years. We have patients who present with megacolon. We don't think of those as having differences in their pathophysiology. We believe that that's simply a black box in terms of the immune system and differences in the target organ. So I don't think it's a question of pathophysiology. We don't understand our immunological therapy, as I've shown you. ATG that's more potent should work better. Cytoxan should work better. Adding rapamycin, adding uh, other drugs to cyclosporin should work better. They don't. Horse ATG and cyclosporin remains the standard and gives us the best results. And I think that the more likely explanation for why some patients do not respond is that they don't have a stem cell reserve that's adequate. But that's something that we felt hopeless and uh, concerning up until recently. And I wanted, this is, the, this is the simple diagram that if you don't have any stem cells, you've got nothing to work on when you remove the immune uh, factors. And the desire, of course, would be to treat patients or to shift the curve to the right so that we're treating patients who have better blood counts and better stem cells at the outset. We know that stem cells are low in patients by indirect methods. This is a, 
a, a particular type of bone marrow uh, and peripheral blood assay for very primitive progenitor cells. And what I want you to appreciate is that there are very reduced numbers in all, all patients. This is per mononuclear cell in the bone marrow. This is per volume of blood. These are severe aplastics compared to normals. If you multiply this by the 3 or 4 percent, which is the number of cells that are left in an aplastic bone marrow, you've got 95 to 99 percent uh, elimination of uh, bone marrow stem and progenitor cells in patients with aplasia shear down at the very bottom of the curve. And we know that patients who either have good blood counts to begin with or as shown here or have a complete recovery after they're treated with uh, antithymocyte globulin and cyclosporine do better long term. They have better survival and they have fewer long term complications. And this is just one of many examples suggesting that the initial stem cell reservoir reserve is, dictates how patients do long term. So uh, we didn't uh, know how to address this. And again, more or less accidentally, uh, we were able to discover what we think is the first effective stem cell stimulator uh, that's available in clinical practice. And it's this small molecule called l -trombopag. And the hematologists in the audience will have familiarity with this in the context of idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpurer. It's licensed for use in patients with refractory ITP. And my colleague, Cindy Dunbar, and I undertook a study really with uh, the premise that we would avoid unnecessary use of this expensive agent in patients with low platelet counts. That simply having a drug that was thought to influence platelet counts didn't mean that you should use it in a patient who's thrombocytopenic as a result of bone marrow failure because other growth factors don't work very well in bone marrow. In EPO, patients have sky high levels of erythropoietin. Given EPO, it doesn't do much. Same with Neupogen, GCSF. And we knew from our own studies over the course of several decades, I'm just showing a paper, two, uh, results from two papers, that TPO levels, thrombopoietin levels, are really quite high in patients with aplastic anemia. So l pack should not work. Now, this also ended up in the New England Journal because the results were, again, uh, counter to our hypothesis and expectations. Uh, we took patients who had extremely refractory aplastic anemia, had failed immunosuppression, failed other growth factors, failed male hormones, treated them with l pack, and about half of them showed responses. That was totally unexpected. And even more surprising was the quality of the responses. First, they were either bi or tri lineage, not just in platelets. So that, effect, that suggested a broad effect or a specific effect on stem cells. Second, they were very robust. It wasn't a matter of the platelet counts creeping up by 10 or 20,000. This shows you plate responses, some of them into the normal range in the course of six months. Hemoglobin, even more impressive. These patients who have responded are now uh, receiving or under, undergoing phlebotomy to remove excess iron. I won't show you the neutrophils, but they also comparably went up. And third, the bone marrow is filled up. So when we looked at uh, six, nine, 12 months after treatment, and I'm showing you three pre and post pairs, you see the three of these four patients actually have normal bone marrow cellularity, which we actually don't see when we treat with immunosuppression. The patients get better, the bone marrows remain hypocellular. So this really suggested that we had shifted uh, the stem cell number um, to the right and that we now had more operating stem cells in these patients. We have a current trial that's combining, which I think would be logical, combining upfront in patients with aplastic anemia, immunosuppression, and l -trombopag. And I'll just show you the sorts of results we're obtaining. This is a young Navy petty officer who also had coincidentally eosinophilic fasciitis. It's one of the rheumatologic syndromes associated with aplastic anemia. You see not only that his bone marrow fills up when he's uh, assayed, uh, in this instance, at uh, three months, but uh, shown on the right are CD34 cells, which are also now visible, not excessively, but visible in this patient. These are the early results of this study. Very high response rate uh, to date at six months. 90% of patients have responded. Um, and the robustness of the responses is also very striking. Patients' blood counts begin to go up in the first month. Again, very atypical for immunosuppression alone. This is the CD34 number. You can ignore the, the, the scientific data, but in the early stages, it looks like we're getting really remarkable increases in CD34 cells in the bone marrow, I think shown here, 30 to 40-fold increases in CD34s. And these are the blood count increases. Again, you see this very striking uh, uh, slope to the curves, very, very rapid increases in reticulocytes, platelets, and neutrophils. Now, there are problems with this type of therapy that uh, will be obvious to uh, many of you so I speak, which is that we are stimulating stem cells, but there's also the risk that we may be stimulating abnormal cells or indeed in the process of, of causing bone marrow cells to turn over uh, lead to problems. So this is the big worry that we have is that we may elicit 
clonal uh, evolution, and I'll show you some data related to that as we finish. I want to make the point in this slide also that the, the obvious question is why does Ultrombopag work when patients have very high levels of thrombopoietin? And I think this is a feature, obviously hypothetical, a feature of, that, of the fact that it's a small molecule, it escapes uh, binding like uh, plasma proteins uh, such as thrombopoietin. There aren't other cells to compete with their receptors. There's only a few stem cells left in the bone marrow of a patient with aplastic anemia. And as a small molecule, we really can flood the hematopoietic niche with very high concentrations, probably orders of magnitude greater than are achieved with thrombopoietin in physiologic or even pathophysiologic circumstances. Now, I want to return to this patient I showed you early on, who 10 years after she was successfully treated, saw her in clinic every year, she's doing great, comes back again bleeding, now with a very uh, malignant appearing bone marrow, blast that you can appreciate, abnormal cytogenetics, and this is the problem of malignant or clonal evolution in patients with aplastic anemia, which is shown in our large series, occurs in about 12 to 15 percent of patients long term. Very troubling. It's really awful to have a patient like this come back after you've had, you know, great success with them, think that they're home free and have them come back with a virtually impossible to treat disease except for transplant. So this is the problem of clonality which is really raised by the great uh, American hematologist Bill Damaschek in the mid 20th century. He put together aplastic anemia, what we would now call myelodysplasia and leukemia and uh, hypothesized some relationships. I and others have followed up on this problem but we really have not understood where the problem, what the problem is, but the problem actually I think now has been solved as to why these patients do go on to develop uh, leukemia. And it has to do with a very fundamental aspect of cell biology of which are the telomeres, the ends of the chromosome and with the stability of chromosomes in general. Uh, information that's so fundamental it's led to a whole series of Nobel Prizes and really dates back even prior to the discovery of DNA experiments that were done in the 1940s and 50s by Mueller and McClintock and then the later discovery of DNA led to this understanding that replication of DNA, the characteristics of replication of DNA would lead to inevitable loss at the ends of the chromosomes um, as a result of the re requirement to produce a fragment in the lagging strand. That, that was not going to be feasible when the DNA replication apparatus reached the termini. There would inevitably be loss as uh, Alexei Olovnikov called it, a marginotomy, a problem with loss of the genetic information that's uh, transmitted from cell to cell with every replication. So nature's solution to that problem, the end replication problem, has been the telomere. And the telomere really is not that complicated a structure. It's DNA. It's uh, hundreds to even thousands of repeated hexanucleotides as shown here with specific proteins that coat the, uh, these hexanucleotides. And this provides uh, many advantages to the cell. First of all, it's nonsense material, so its loss doesn't impact on the transmission of genetic information. Uh, second, this complex forms a stable and recognized uh, 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 end to the chromosome that avoids it being recognized as, for example, a DNA or chromosome fragment or a DNA virus or DNA that needs to be repaired. And the third is it provides a platform, a template, for an active process of uh, repair with every mitosis, which is affected by this complex, the telomerase complex. So there's a telomere, which is the end of the DNA, and telomerase, which is an enzymatic complex that will add on hexanucleotides at the end of every mitosis. Doesn't completely repair the, the loss of uh, telomeres, but almost does. So it maintains telomere uh, length in replicating cells. Now telomerase is made up of two major components which I'm going to talk of. One is the enzyme itself, telomerase, encoded by a gene called TERT with a T at the end. The other is the RNA template, so this is a gene that produces an RNA that is the template for the reverse transcription to telomeres and that's called TERC, shown here. This is TERC and this is uh, the gene, uh, the product telomerase. Now when cells get critically short telomeres, uh, they, they uh, are not able to continue to replicate. So under those circumstances, they either go to sleep, undergo senescence, or they undergo apoptosis. For an organ, that's the appropriate response. If you've got a liver and the liver cell has been replicating and replicating and replicating and it reaches the ends of a, develops a critically short telomere in one of the chromosomes, the cell just disappears from the population and uh, that's a benign phenomena as far as the liver is concerned. But if there's suppression 
of the DNA damage or DNA uh, response, uh, DNA repair responses, that's for example in artificial systems in which P53 is eliminated, those cells can continue to replicate. And at that point, the chromosomes have become unstable. Those short telomeres allow end-to-end -end fusions and non-reciprocal translocations and other phenomena that result in aneuploidy and in frank malignancy. So those are the two uh, phenomena. Now, un if we just take cells and put fibroblasts, for example, put them into cell culture, they, we can't culture them indefinitely. That's the Hayflick phenomena. That's due to shortening of telomeres. It can be overcome by inducing or uh, uh, transfecting with a telomere telomerase uh, gene. Um, but we haven't been very clear on what this actually means in human beings until recently. Now, this is a uh, work from our own laboratory, but it's among many papers that have demonstrated that uh, short telomeres and defective telomerase underlie some patients with a anemia that's inherited, it presents either in the pediatric population as a rare syndrome called dyskeratosis congenita, or in adults, more subtly, as aplasticinemia or other types of bone marrow failure. This is our initial paper, and there's a number of points I want to make from this slide. These are, this is the description of the first mutations in telomerase, in the TERT gene. That's the most important component of the enzyme complex, so that's the enzyme itself. Um, and that's what's regulated. So first I want you to appreciate, unfortunately, that this is the pattern of telomere attrition in normals, and telomeres do get short as we age. Not at our age, it's always people that are older than us up here, and most of the, most of the shortening of telomeres occurs early on. So if you have teenage children, you can tell them they're actually aging much faster than you are. And that has to do, of course, with the fact that kids are growing and their organs are growing, so there's a lot of replication going on. The second point is that patients who have a telomeropathy to the extent that we know, almost always will have extremely short telomeres. It's the basis of a commercial blood test. So again, this is something that can be ordered or you can send a patient over to our clinic. We have a CLIA laboratory that does telomere length. And you see that wherever the mutations were in these patients, they result in extremely short telomeres. This is not, this is really fun to work with because this is not uh, a, a gene with some funny combination of letters and numbers, and you're not really sure what the function is, and there's a yeast analog, blah, 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 and you think it's related to a 10% increase in Alzheimer's disease. We have an in vivo assay, which is the telomere length, and we even can look at telomerase activity, um, both transcription and protein, in research laboratories. Now, I want to show you the, the, the spectrum of telomere disease as we see it in the clinic with some, I think, dramatic cases. This is, again, a, a military officer, really a really remarkable story. He's airlifted out of Afghanistan, um, because, uh, not because he has a blood problem, but because he has tongue cancer, which is a, a, a diagnosed while he's there. Comes back, he already has metastatic disease, shown here in the CT scan. Now, I wish I could say that I was the physician who made the diagnosis, but a very astute uh, army hematologist looked at his nails and said, and his skin and said, hmm, this looks like stuff that I heard about in medical school. This is dyskeratosis congenita. So this patient we showed had a mutation in the DKC1 gene, which that protein product stabilizes the telomer telomerase complex. Really critical, and that's what we see in children with X-linked, very severe dyskeratosis congenita. So this is, this is the pediatrician's uh, dream. This is late presentation of a clearly pediatric uh, disease. Uh, presenting in adulthood. By the way, this patient's bone marrow disappeared when he got a single round of chemotherapy. So he had underlying severe bone marrow failure, but it wasn't apparent at uh, the time of diagnosis of his cancer. Now this is the other end of the spectrum. Here's a patient who presented to our clinic with a fairly modest history. A little bit of thrombocytopenia over the course of about a decade, not terribly severe. He had big red cells, which is very typical. An elevated MCV is a very good sign of a bone marrow failure and is often seen in these patients with telomerase. He had hair that had grayed uh, when he was in his early uh, 20s. This is a very easy thing to look for and to ask for in the clinic. It's a good icebreaker to ask a male or female patient whether they've dyed their hair. You know, they always wonder why you're intruding, but in fact, this is a very typical history in the patient and in the family. Not pathognomonic, but suggestive of um, a telomere problem. This guy took, his, uh, took a picture of his hair after we identified that he had extremely short telomeres and a mutation uh, in uh, Turk um, uh, in our laboratory. So this is the more typical presentation of a patient with a telomeropathy. And you can see why this has been missed, because these are fairly subtle hematologic manifestations. He also had cryptic cirrhosis. I'm going to get to that in a moment. This is a fantastic family that we've studied. They live about an hour and a half from, uh, uh, from uh, NIH. 
They're uh, farming people, they're Mennonites, and the Mennonites and Amish are uh, terrific for genetic studies. It's uh, familiar, of course, to those who are hearing, uh, listening in from uh, Johns Hopkins. This family is big. This is the picture was taken after lunch um, when half of them had gone back to their tasks. They keep excellent genealogic uh, records. So we can trace them back at least uh, six generations. Um, everyone shown in green had a novel mutation in the telomerase gene. Those in white have wild type uh, telomerase. The patient uh, that we saw had presented, he's a dairy farmer, presented again with a story of very uh, modest bone marrow problems, a progressive thrombocytopenia and anemia, uh, but had a striking family history in retrospect, although we didn't recognize it at the time. He did indeed have gray hair. It was easy to make the diagnosis when we walked into the, uh, into the room and saw him. He had failed a previous therapy given elsewhere. He was transplanted by, by my colleague Rick Childs. An excellent example of the value of genetic testing because we had a choice of HLA match siblings, one of whom was a young woman with uh, macrocytosis who was HLA match. She had the mutation. That's a disaster. You don't want to actually transplant from somebody in the family, as I'll show you in a moment, even if they have normal blood counts. And he's done quite well with really minimal problems following transplant. This is the problem in families, is that everyone who carries a mutation has a defect in hematopoiesis, even if their blood counts are normal. Uh, these are a number of family members from another family showing hypoplastic bone marrows, normal blood counts, but if you look at measures of hematopoiesis, colony formation, CD34 cell number, and so on, they're much decreased and the growth factors are elevated. So we think that patients can maintain normal blood counts for a lifetime, and some other factor, immunologic presumably, is what um, overlays and causes disease. This is the same family showing a second manifestation very important to remember of uh, telomere disease, which is cirrhosis or liver failure. So four women in this family ultimately suffer, suffered fatal liver failure, including a young woman who died just uh, recently who had had a liver transplant um, when she was 19 for liver failure, had done well for 20 years, and then finally succumbed. Um, I'm going to show you some of these patients, but I want to stress that this is something we've not appreciated uh, explicitly. I published a paper that uh, was in one of the lesser of the hematology journals uh, several decades ago, recognizing a relationship between cirrhosis and aplastic anemia. No idea why. Um, when we began to understand the telomere uh, diseases, I remember the patients, that's already a triumph, to remember the patient's uh, name. I hadn't seen them in 20 years. But we couldn't reach them. The doctor had died. Uh, the phone number that we had didn't answer. I finally got a phone call quite accidentally from Susan Lightman in our transfusion medicine department who said, I have a young woman here who wants to donate to the National Debt Marrow Donor Program uh, because uh, of the terrible story in her family. And she says that you had seen her brother and her father some years ago, which is the case. So the story was bad. I saw the, the young man um, who had very modest thrombocytopenia. He progressed outside of our hands and went to transplant and died. His father also had aplastic anemia. Um, he, under, uh, he ended up with esophageal varices due to severe cirrhosis and bled to death from his gastrointestinal tract. Terrible story. So we saw this young woman, and actually she had short telomeres, which was awful. You know, she's got a couple of kids there, looks great. But she did not have a telomeropathy because her genes was normal. So why is her telomere short? She inherited those from her father. So the father's sperm also had very short telomeres, and the mean telomere length was reduced. But if you can repair your telomeres, work that Richard Hodes has done in the mouse and we've done in humans. It appears that if you can repair your telomeres, even if you start with them being short, it doesn't lead to disease. So she was fine. Her kids are fine. She has a brother who was um, having problems with alcohol because he'd had, obviously, the sense of being fated to have a terrible disease. He also ended up having normal telomeres and, uh, I'm sorry, having a normal telomerase genes. Um, so he didn't need to worry about that. So we've also shown, as has a German group, that Telomere, telomerase gene mutations occur rather frequently in patients with cirrhosis independent of any prior history, family or otherwise. So this may be actually the most common uh, manifestation of the telomeropathies, which is cirrhosis, often in the context of uh, hepatitis infection or steatosis uh, with diabetes um, um, or with alcohol. So this is an underlying risk factor in about 5 to 8 percent of patients as in our study and in the concurrent German study. Now, the third manifestation that you need to remember for the telomeropathies is pulmonary fibrosis. This is recognized by others. This is one of the members of the Mennonite family. She actually made the diagnosis of pulmonary disease at an NIH conference. She turned to her husband and said, I've been short of breath for the last month or two, and this is her CT scan. And she actually died a couple of months later with a combination of pulmonary fibrosis, 
cryptic cirrhosis, which was uh, diagnosed on liver biopsy and bone marrow failure. This is uh, the documentation of pulmonary fibrosis, familial, and telomerase mutations. This is from our own hematology service. There's a very wide range of hematologic disease that's associated with uh, telomere gene uh, mutations from moderate aplastic anemia, MDS, aplastic anemia, and even leukemia. A few subtle points about the telomeropathies. Here's a family where we could not identify a mutation in TURT or TURK, obviously not in DKC1, that was a female patient. And it was only until we looked at the promoter region uh, that we found a mutation in the cat, uh, uh, shown here in the cat gene, in the cat box of the promoter, very important binding site for transcription factors. This is actually the first pathogenic mutation in this region ever described in humans. So the regulation of the telomere repair complex is complex, including not only the promoter and other regulatory regions for the genes, but other genes that impact on telomerase activity. This is a very unusual, very striking, and important uh, example of uh, telomere disease in the clinic. Patient who's uh, uh, got a separate disease gets an umbilical cord transplant, very prolonged period of engraftment, and donor cell leukemia a year and a half later. And this is a patient of our colleagues in the Cancer Institute. And the umbilical cord blood that had been infused into this patient, the telomere is half of the length of normal. So a deficient product, for reasons that are not uh, clear, the, all these balls represent the telomere length in that in, infused umbilical cord blood in the patient after uh, um, infusion of these cells, and the patient ultimately succumbed to their donor leukemia. And finally, we can model uh, uh, this disease in uh, inducible pluripotent stem cells, as shown here, a paper that's actually just appeared in uh, JCI, and showing that, again, in uh, in, inducible, in IPS, you see this reduction in uh, telomere repair that occurs uh, in vitro uh, as it appears to occur also in vivo. So this is, the, this is the diagram to remember that first this disease can manifest in three organs. It, we think that um, uh, telomere repair is the substrate on which environmental factors like alcohol or uh, hepatitis virus for liver, smoking for patients with pulmonary fibrosis and the immune system for marrow failure. And a way of thinking about dyskeratosis congenita as it relates with a very highly penetrant set of genes, um, almost always resulting in disease in the first decade of life, associated with skin and mucosal membrane problems, and the, these mutations occurring more subtly in the adult population. Now, I want to return to this patient to complete my talk with the link between telomere attrition and cancer. So in this patient, there was a remarkable feature, which is uh, that his father had died in Baltimore uh, many years ago with uh, early onset myelodysplastic syndrome and acute myeloid leukemia. Not only was he young when he presented with this in his 30s, but he had an unusual course, which is that he died after a single round of chemotherapy. And almost always we can get patients, even uh, uh, adult, uh, older patients, through one round of uh, in remission uh, inducing chemotherapy. This patient died, never recovered his blood counts. So he also, we learned on uh, testing of uh, archival bone marrow, had the same mutation as did our patient. And that led to a larger study uh, by my colleague Rodrigo Collado, showing that again in between 5 and 10 percent of patients with new onset acute myeloid leukemia, this is non-APL, we can find mutations in the telomerase gene complex. Again, germline mutations that are the uh, risk factor for the development of leukemia and almost always associated with chromosome abnormalities. That's not expected because about 50 percent of patients have normal chromosomes when they present with AML. When we look at our patients with aplastic anemia and ask the question, is there a relationship between telomere attrition and outcome, again we see this very strong link with short telomeres in this instance not related to genetic mutations, but simply to the pathophysiology of aplastic anemia, the requirement of limited numbers of stem cells to replicate in order to compensate for stem cell loss and low blood counts. So this work published in JAMA a couple of years ago now shows that the major risk factor for malignant clonal evolution, mainly monosomy 7, is, in, is having short telomeres, even in the normal range shown here. So patients with the lowest quartile of telomeres have about five to seven-fold higher rate of clonal evolution and of evolution to monosomy 7 than do those patients who have longer telomeres. And we can see that in patients months to years before they manifest with chromosome abnormalities. If we take their bone marrows that we've stored out of the freezer 
and grow them with the uh, normal growth factors. Those patients with short telomeres, which you can see here, here's just a slide of the chromosomes. You see that many of these, let me see if I can get to the back. Many of these uh, chromosomes are lacking a telomere. You should have seen nice double-headed worms, as we see on the left side with the longer telomeres. When we take those cells out and culture them, we see abnormalities in the chromosomes. This is spectrocaryotyping of a variety of bone marrow showing you chromosome rearrangements in their bone marrows occurring ex vivo years before they present. This is more recent data showing that those patients who undergo clonal evolution have extraordinarily accelerated telomere attrition. So the normal telomere loss is on the order of 40 to 60 nucleotides per year in a normal person, and that's also the loss that occurs in patients with stable aplastic anemia in those patients who progress. It's about five to 10 times higher, so on the order of 400 versus 60 base pairs per year. That's an extraordinary acceleration in telomere loss. Again, not because we think they have mutations, but because limited numbers of stem cells are attempting to compensate for the total. And we can also see that at the level of the individual chromosome. I'm just showing you this is an example. This is a method that's called STELA, or single telomere length analysis. We're looking here at the X and Y chromosomes. Here's a patient with stable uh, disease. This is a southern hybridization. And over the course of uh, many months, you see there's this nice peak in telomere length, no changes. Here's a patient who's undergoing telomere attrition, which we can see in this individual chromosome, the telomeres get short. That telomere gets short uh, over the course of two years. And that is the typical pattern in patients who go to malignant uh, transformation. I'm just showing you some summary slides here. Now, we've actually had the opportunity to do the, or taken advantage of the ability to do the first, I think, direct comparison of genetics, genomics, and chromosome genomics, as evidenced by this telomere attrition. So our patients are going on to severe pancytopenia, MDS, and leukemia. And there are now about 60 candidate genes, some of which have just recently uh, again been uh, described, in patients with acute leukemia. So we looked in our patients at those 50 or 60 candidate genes, asking why they're mutations, and comparing that with this telomere attrition that I've shown you, which is a regular occurrence prior. So these are the genes, and this is an example of the data that we've obtained. So in two of these patients, indeed, we did detect mutations in uh, two of the genes that have been implicated in leukemia and MDS. One of them is DNMT3A, which is a gene that affects hematopoietic cell differentiation versus self-renewal. But these were present in our patients for years beforehand and apparently stable. This is a patient who actually was successfully treated with immunosuppression as a DNMT3 large clone remains stable as she goes in and out of remission, second patient shown here. But in six of our eight patients, there were no mutations in any of the 60 candidate genes that have been implicated in MDS and AML. And in a much larger series of 30 to 40 patients with aplastic anemia, Again, we see no mutations in DNMT3A or the other major mutations. So at least the hypothesis for now is that this progression to chromosome instability, which predisposes to leukemia, to severe pancytopenia, to MDS, occurs independent of selective mutations in these candidate genes, and as a result, not surprisingly, of this accelerated telomere attrition due to limited stem cell number. And that, by the way, would appear to explain why patients who have better stem cell numbers when they present to treatment do better long term. And patients who can get a complete recovery, that's indirectly evidence of the fact that they've got sufficient stem cells to avoid this rapid telomere attrition. So this is just telomere lengths in those patients who have now undergone l trombopag therapy. And I think you can appreciate that in patients who have treatment-naive disease shown in red, they've got much longer telomeres in general than those patients who have refractory disease, who've been hanging around for two, three, four, or five years before they get a trauma pack. And if we look at those patients who undergo clonal evolution when their bone marrows are stimulated with a trauma pack, that's shown in red. Again, you appreciate that they're, in general, at the lower, lower portion of the telomere length. And indeed, the patients who are up here at the top tend to have rapid and uh, successful uh, um, uh, re reconstitution of their bone marrows, shown here. So this is the summary of the cancer story. Of course, genetic mutations, those are easy to look at, um, but we also know that the major risk factor for virtually all cancers is aging. And as I've shown you, telomere attrition is just a normal phenomena that occurs with aging, and I think is likely to underlie all of those aneuploid uh, cancers that we see in other organs in addition to the bone marrow. And it is, in, in fact, in this middle group of immune and inflammatory diseases 
where there's been this link that we've been looking at for well over 100 years between a state of chronic inflammation or um, immune destruction and the later development of cancer that I think telomere biology actually provides the link. And there are many examples, uh, everyone in a subspecialty can think of a disease like ulcerative colitis and its predisposition to colon cancer, esophageal uh, uh, cancer following on Barrett's esophagitis, graft versus host disease and late cancers, many links. And I think that these are explicable by telomere biology, all of which predicted well before the, uh, any of us were born uh, by this uh, brilliant uh, young uh, guy, Theodore Bovary, very sad story. He published this fantastic monograph just at the beginning of the First World War in German, and it really attracted far too little attention. He died a little bit after the war, very sad story. But he's really a brilliant, brilliant uh, book in terms of describing the importance of chromosomes and their instability. Now, I want to finish with at least one hopeful note. So can we do anything about this? So this is one of our, uh, this is one of our Mennonite uh, patients holding up her handmade chart. She had aplastic anemia. Her handmade chart of her hematocrit when she was treated with a very old-fashioned therapy for aplastic anemia, one we know works in a subset of patients, which are male hormones. So here she got, down, she got um, a decadorobalin, hematocrit goes to normal and actually stays up on decadorobalin for a decade. So we've shown recently that the mechanism of action for male hormones acting on the bone marrow is almost certainly through telomerase. Uh, we've not really known what the mechanism is, and I think this is the most likely one. So this is just the effect of a variety of sex hormones, male and female, on telomere activity, telomerase activity in vitro, in hematopoietic cells. You can also show the same thing in lymphocytes. Um, and this is the model based on many enzyme, enzyme uh, uh, inhibition experiments. It is actually through the female uh, sex hormone estradiol and the binding site estrogen response elements that are present in the promoter of the TERT gene, of that critical telomerase gene, that these hormones uh, act and upregulate telomerase. And maybe that's in fact why our telomeres are stable through much of our adult life, is that we've got the sustenance as a result of sex hormone activity. We can even model this in animals, so if we take TERK or TERT deficient animals, we can avoid telomere length as uh, telomere attrition as, for example, after transplant with limiting numbers of cells. You can see the difference in these mouse experiments between animals treated with testosterone and those not. If they, there's no telomerase, that doesn't occur. Here's animals that are exposed to repeated doses of total body radiation. Young animals, longer telomeres. Older animals, even more striking, avoiding telomere, uh, t telomere attrition. So finishing, we have a protocol uh, that's uh, up and uh, running actually at NIH looking at long course of danazol in patients who have short telomeres with or without telomerase gene mutations. This just shows you the, the characteristics of the protocol. And this is the effect on telomere length, which danazol appears to stabilize or actually allow elongation in these patients with short telomeres uh, and leads to hematopoietic recovery in the majority when we select these patients based on telomere length, danazol works. That's it. So I want to thank, of course, the people who did all of the uh, bench work and clinical work, uh, especially Rodrigo Collado, Phil Scheinberg, and others uh, for um, uh, uh, putting this all together. And thank you for your attention. We have a lot of other comments or questions for Dr. Young. I have one while, uh, while we can get going. Um, the length of the telomere comes down, and when does the chromosome become unstable and why it becomes stable. Yeah. So uh, the answer to that is actually not entirely known. The, the t we don't know in humans. Certainly in cell lines, there are well demarcated uh, telomere lengths that are not consistent with the cell continuing to replicate. And one of the problems is that it's not the average telomere length, it's a single chromosome. Mm -hmm. Once that single chromosome develops extremely short telomeres, the cell will stop replicating. It'll go to sleep. It induces the appropriate responses for senescence or apoptosis. So it's very dependent on, in that particular cell, which chromosome is critically short. Now, the reasons for instability are not known in detail. But what occurs and what can be easily seen in cell culture and in animal models, and I think you can see it in humans, is end-to-end -end fusion. So without the full telomere, the chromosomes just stick to each other and are dragged across the uh, anaphase plate. Yes. Mm. I, I think this is cutting edge. Eventually, we'll be ordering stem cell reserve and telomere replication. But could you talk a little bit more just about anemia, chronic disease? At least that's what the clinicians call it, especially in inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. Should we do any screening tests or be concerned? Yeah, so that's actually a very interesting question. Um, 
You know, I think if it's, uh, so let me give you the simpler, uh, you know, if you've got a patient with, uh, with liver disease and they're anemic, I wouldn't blow that off to uh, their, uh, you know, having some, I mean, in fact, the, there often are big red cells in that setting, aren't there? I wouldn't blow that off to just be a secondary effect of the cirrhosis, which is what's been done since, uh, since I was an intern. That may well be evidence of an underlying telomere, telomeropathy. I think the issue of, uh, of chronic inflammatory disease or, or, or of chronic anemia is more complicated because I've, sh you know, what, what I've argued and which I think is important in this general setting of inflammation is that there's, there's a regenerative stress in an organ. Liver, lung, we don't know. 73 different cell types, who knows which, which of them is involved. Bone marrow is pretty easy. Stem cells are just chugging it out and their telomeres are getting short because there are too few of them. But the other mechanism that, uh, that um, has been postulated, for example, there's a very strong link between short telomeres and atherosclerotic disease, cardiac uh, outcomes and so on. Now, is that due to telomere shorting occurring in endothelial cells? Possibly, but the hypothesis has been that it's actually a reflection of reactive oxygen species. There's just more damage to the chromosome in general, and the telomere is part of the chromosome, so you're going to see that being affected and be short. So telomeres may indeed be short in patients with, in, in, with increased reactive oxygen species as, a, as part of a, of a chronic inflammatory or a tumor or some other underlying problem. It's really not been looked at. I mean, actually, it would be interesting to see, I, we've not looked and, you know, it's just hard to study those patients because usually their anemia is not their major problem. But uh, that'd be an easy thing for us to do. For our audience beyond the auditorium, you know, could you paraphrase the question? Um, sure. The, what is the definition of normal length, uh, actually? I notice also KB as the unit of the length. What does it stand well, for? Well, it depends on the age. So, you, and it also depends on the assay. So the assay that we use is uh, uh, gene amplification. Sorry, the, the question was the normal, what's normal? And normal depends on how old you are and, and what the assay is. So the normal for an umbilical cord blood, as you can see, is much larger, much higher than the normal for an uh, elderly person in their 80s or 90s. But there's actually some, you know, there actually is overlap between uh, older humans with, uh, with their longer telomeres and some children with relatively short telomeres. So it's not an either or. So it's always age adjusted and it depends also on the assay. The gold standard or the standard is a southern hybridization, but it's very cumbersome to do and not suitable for screening. We use, we use gene amplification, so it's a reverse PCR, and we have a range of kilobases of telomere length that we calculate for any particular age. There's a commercial assay that also depends on fish uh, and flow, and they also have a range of normals, but it's always age dependent. The kilobases is the, the length? Actually. Yes. The unit of the length? It's the length of the telomere. No. No, we haven't had a chance to look at telomere length and porphyria. Well, the Venables removed essentially the practice a couple of decades ago to break lives of anemia. Now, it's apparently used quite freely in other countries. Is there any relationship to that, or do you think foreign chemicals? Actually, that's really a brilliant question. Uh, I mean, really, the, the, sometimes you get a question that just makes you think, sorry. So this is a brilliant question because it has to do with chloramphenicol. So there's been... Uh, you know, chloramphenicol was related in the 60s and 70s to uh, actually epidemics of aplastic anemia supposedly occurring in the United States. So let me say first, I'm not sure of that relationship, but then I'll assume that there is one. I'm not sure because the epidemiology is really not very good. And it's unfortunately one of those examples of somebody publishes one paper with a lot of now, in retrospect, defects in the methodology, as for example, the chloramphenicol being given after the aplastic anemia actually occurred, but that wasn't looked at very carefully. I mean, that's kind of not likely to be a cause and effect. So we don't actually know. And when you look at, uh, if you look either at uh, East Asia, we saw no relationship with chloramphenicol and aplastic anemia. It's freely available, it's still widely used. If you look at countries like Sweden and others where they actually monitored the amount of chloramphenicol that they imported and also had rates of aplastic anemia. No relationship between the chloramphenicol going up and coming down. So it's still a little bit left up in the air. The second point I want to make is it's often hard to make the distinction between cause and effect. The story with the early graying in telomeres is pretty illustrative of that. So there's a little literature about hair dye causing aplastic anemia. Now, if, you know, if you or your wife uses a hair dye, um, you know that it smells bad and it looks like it should cause all sorts of diseases. So it seemed logical that hair dye could be a cause, you know, put on your head, scalp, it all gets absorbed, that it could cause bad things. But I don't think that that's a relationship at all. I think what we were detecting were those patients who were dyeing their hair 
because it was gray early and they had a, a, a fundamental genetic lesion that they were obscuring uh, when they looked at their hair. But the last point of your question, the part that I think is really um, uh, interesting is that chloramphenicol does have a very regular effect on the bone marrow. And these were done, actually, it's, I hesitate to even, uh, I hesitate to actually even describe them because they were probably unethical. You know, we're not really supposed to talk about unethical studies. Uh, but I'll, since having brought it up, I'll finish it. So there were studies done, let's say, at an unnamed institution on terminally uh, ill cancer patients in which massive doses of chloramphenicol were given to them in their terminal phases. And what happened in those patients very consistently is that they developed a profound anemia. So you could speculate that what chloramphenicol was doing was creating a tremendous regenerative stress on the bone marrow and that it could in fact be linked by that mechanism to a bone marrow failure. But that's again speculative. It's quite a good antibiotic and wouldn't it be interesting to know if there are some people that are impervious to that? Yeah, that was actually speculated about many years ago because one of the, one of the questions, you know, there's a famous hematologist uh, whose name I'm blocking, but you may remember it, Wash Yu, who went down to Columbia. He had this relationship with Columbia. And he, what he observed was that there seemed to be this outbreak of uh, chloramphenicol-related aplastic anemia, and then it went away. So you, did you actually, at that, had you eliminated all those susceptibles in the population and chloramphenicol could continue to be given? Any elderly patient of those studied over the age of 100 who have relatively longer telomeres. Yeah, well, how do we know they're longer? That's the problem. So, so the, the, the studies that have been done, and I, this is also a very critical question. There are some famous people, even those who run the Nobel Prize now, who are promoting this idea of getting your telomeres measured and then you'll see how long you live, because there are a lot of studies that have suggested some relationship with longevity. Um, I have pretty long telomeres, so you know, I don't have a, uh, I, I, you know, I prefer to believe that that were the case. But let me tell you what my, my reservations are, and then I'll answer your question directly. The question has to do with long, the telomere length in very old people, and centenarians, uh, for example. So I think that the problem is really one of selective publication, that a lot of studies that are negative or don't show a relationship really just don't appear. Um, and uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really skeptical of this relationship cause and effect that telomeres actually cause aging. Um, and again, I mentioned that there's this overlap between kids with particularly short but normal telomeres and older people, 60s, 70s, and 80s, who have telomeres that are particularly long and actually are in the same length as, uh, as children. So it's kind of hard to think that that's cause and effect when you've got that sort of overlap. Your question, though, is really a hard one to answer because what is the right telomere length for a person who's 90 years old? And what has been looked at um, are just the telomere lengths per se. They are a certain number. They're obviously shorter than somebody who's 50 or 20. But what is striking is that they're in a very narrow range. But I think that that, without getting into the complexities, that only reflects the fact that the homeostasis of the hematopoietic system may lead to a regression to the mean. It's complicated, but the idea would be that those hematopoietic stem cells with particularly short telomeres get eliminated, and you now have a population that's actually fairly consistent in its telomere length. That's what survived to in the person that's 90 or 100. So but there's no optimal length because we don't know, we, who do we compare it with? You got to be 100, that presumably is the right telomere length for getting to be 100. So in cryptogenic cirrhosis, it's your hypothesis that it's turnover in liver cells that really Correct. drive it. Correct. And there are actually quite good animal models of Depino, Leonard Rudolph, and others that suggests that that is, in fact, the mechanism for that and for hepatocellular carcinoma. I recall taking most of the liver out of the lab and a week later the thing was back. Mm -hmm. the yeah, the liver is quite regenerative, right? Is the change in length of telomeres over time consistent, or does it alter? No, it does change. Um, and that may be important is the rate of change. So as you saw, the, you know, the curve is sigmoid. So the rate of change in childhood is much rapider than it is in most of our adult life, where telomeres are relatively stable until we get whatever age I am, one year older. <laughs> yes? Uh, I think something very important to note is that nutrition and what you eat can affect the telomeres. Yeah, so that's really, that's the problem. <laughs> okay, so that is the sort of, uh, I think really not, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be tactful. I think that's the sort of information that is very easy to, uh, yeah. No, they, of course, they're all in scientific journals, but I mean, you know, it's even hard to define what a scientific journal is. So the question has to do with the relationship between nutrition and what you eat and telomere mm -hmm. length. So I don't know how you actually do such a study. I mean, as I've shown you, there's very little telomere length that changes. So you go back and you ask people whether they're eating, you know, a lot of red meat versus a lot of green vegetables, and you look at the telomere length. I really, I just don't believe it. 
And I think that, um, you know, I think it's a diversion from all the things that, I mean, when these sort of studies come out and then people are making money because they're measuring telomere length and, you know, you see something on the news, I mean, that's the point at which you should become not just skeptical but somewhat cynical. And red wine. Yeah, it's the red wine, right, and we'll see how well that works. Maybe. But I think this is the reason to One last question. Uh, I saw all the uh, associations of uh, GI uh, inflammatory reactions to cancer, but in the lung, uh, it led to pulmonary fibrosis, cigarette smoking. Why not cancer? It does. So uh, oh, well, I can't say it does, but the GWASs that have been done do show a link between short telomeres and. Um, between short telomeres and more important between SNPs in telomerase uh, and other telomere related genes in lung cancer. So there, it's not a relationship that holds true for all cancer. So this is where you have to be, where I have to be careful. So you can make these broad statements that you know, problems either genetic or otherwise always underlie cancer and they have to do with telomeres. So for example, in breast cancer, the literature is all over the place. You know, some GWASs are show a negative association, some show a positive. But for lung cancer, the relationship is pretty consistent that either SNPs or telomere length actually do relate to susceptibility to, to lung cancer. So it's not different um, from liver. Well, it seems in our sample of one that long telomeres are associated with excellent lectures. <laughs> Thank you.